So hello everyone. Um, my name's uh, Simon Duffy. I'm the director of the Centre for Welfare Reform and we're hosting the launch event for this very important report that's coming out today. I already have a job getting through the day, which is then about improving policies for welfare and work for people with energy limiting chronic illness. Um, we've got a great panel of speakers and um, we're going to, I'm going to explain the agenda in a, in a little minute, but I thought I'd just start by saying a little bit of background to this event. Um, back in the, when the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition started in 2010 there was a whole slew of um, so-called welfare reforms and um, which were having a and continue to have a very negative impact on the lives of um, many disabled people but one of the most important groups um, that were harmed by these non-reforms were people with chronic illness and out of that um, as a response to that a network of independent researchers emerged this is the same time as the center for welfare reform was being launched which was in 2009 so as we were trying to talk about positive reforms and um, criticize the uh, coalition government's uh, agenda we discovered that there were an amazing network of independent disability researchers coming up called the Spartacus Network, publishing really insightful, powerful work, showing the lack of evidence for the government's own reforms, show, undermining uh, the rationale of those reforms, and instead offering practical suggestions on what to do instead. Um, this is very inspiring for us and so we have tried through that uh, periods ever since 2010 to try and offer as much support as we could to um, people with chronic illness um, and to this network of independent researchers. Back in, I'm, I'm not sure it was 2016 or 2017, one of the leading stars of that network, Catherine Hale, approached us and asked whether we would support a bid to the National Lottery's Drill Fund for Disability Research uh, to, to establish um, the Chronic Illness Inclusion Project. And, and that's what we did. And one of the things that's amazed me over the, the last few years has been the incredible high quality output that have come from Catherine and her colleagues Although that, and I do make this point to uh, Drill and the, the people involved, uh, the funding that they've received is the, probably one of the smallest amounts of funding any of the disability, disability groups have received, yet they've, received, they've achieved an enormous amount with a tiny amount of funding. Um, and this report really goes back to those days. So this report builds on a lot of the evidence and data that was gathered in that period but now what we've been able to do is team up with Dr. Joe Ingold and Dr. Kate Hardy, um, who um, Joe is at the Deakin Business School in Melbourne, but was at Leeds uh, with Kate and with funding from ESRC and uh, CERIC um, and working in partnership with the Leeds Social Sciences Institute. We've been able to go further, look deeper into the data and do more investigation uh, and so the report has been published today. And um, I can see that Joe's having a problem, I think, getting out of his uh, slideshow. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, oh, well done, Joe. Um, as I'm just about to introduce Joe. So the event today is going to, we're going to have a, a range of different speakers. I'll go through the agenda in a minute. Um, but I also want to, um, introduce Joe Chris, who's our kind of technical support. The Centre for Welfare Reform 
works very closely with our partners, a like-minded organization in Sheffield called Opus Independence. If you've not checked out Sheffield's Festival of, De Festival of Debate, which will be um, opening in a few weeks, then please do. All the events are online. It's Britain's biggest non-partisan uh, political festival, and it's got some great content coming up. And um, Joe, would you, are you there? Yeah. Would you like to just say a little bit about um, what's going on today logistically for the audience um, and, uh, and offer any other kind of uh, pointers for us? Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, so my name is Joe and I'll be doing the uh, tech webinar support uh, for this session. Um, so please do uh, put any questions uh, in the chat or the Q&A. And if you'd like to ask uh, any questions at all to any of the speakers, there will be a Q&A section um, at the end of today's webinar. Um, just to remind uh, all other sort of speakers who were part of today's session, if you could please keep your video off uh, until it's your scheduled uh, time to appear as the webinar. That would be uh, much appreciated. And uh, yeah, thanks, Simon, for giving a bit of a shout out to the Festival of Debate, um, which is, as Simon said, is a big sort of non-partisan political festival that is starting uh, from the 4th of May running to the 6th of June. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different events going on then, um, if you'd like to join us for, for some of those. But yes, that's, that's it from me. I'll uh, hand back to you, Simon. Okay. Okay. So, Joe, could you just put up the agenda? Um, <laughs> and so we've got it. So we're going to. Um, Joe Ingold isn't going to chair. I am because Joe's feeling a little bit poorly today. So we're we're fortunate that we're going to hear from Joe a little later on. She's going to be talking about the research and particularly. Uh, what the learning is around employment. Um, but we're going to start shortly with Catherine Hale, um, and she will talk about the concept of energy limiting chronic illness and the backgrounds of this research. Uh, that will be followed by Steph Benstead, who also somebody living with chronic illness, who will talk about um, energy limiting chronic illness and social security. Steph is also an amazing independent researcher. Uh, her book, Second Class Citizens, I would strongly recommend. Um, we're also going to, lucky to have here Vicky Foxcroft, who's the disability uh, lead for the Labour Party, and she will give a response. Vicky's already told us that she's read the report thoroughly already, which is very impressive indeed. We were going to hear from Victoria Clutton, who's one of the members of the group, but and this is one of the realities of... Um, energy limiting chronic illness that Victoria is just too unwell to join us today. And then we will hear from Pippa Stacey and Steve Schutz about Astrid employment support uh, that works well for people with chronic illness. And finally, we'll get a response from Carol Monaghan, um, who is the chair of the all party group on ME. And um, then we will have time the last 25 minutes for questions. So with questions, we may be able to respond to some of the questions live in the chat or the Q&A function, but my job as the chair is I will try and pick out some of the questions. I'm sure there, were, there could easily be too many for us, but I'll try and pick out some of the questions and get some of the speakers to speak to those questions in that final session. So um, please do carry on putting up questions and we'll do our very best. And I'm sure everybody involved will also seek to um, respond or think about the kind of questions that you've, you've put up. So um, I think you can take the agenda down now, Joe, and I, it's just really for me to introduce Catherine Hale as our first speaker. So um, Catherine is a fellow of the Centre for Welfare Four, something I'm very proud about, but she's the founder and director of, the, of Chronic Illness Inclusion, which is this amazing dis disabled people's organisation for people with energy limiting um, chronic illness and chronic pain. She's been an independent researcher, produced multiple reports 
uh, including reports for Mind, Action for ME and Inclusion London. And she's lived herself with energy limiting chronic um, illness for over 30 years. Um, so uh, Catherine, over to you, please. Hi everyone. Uh, it's so exciting to be here and to have you all here with us today. Um, and it's been such a journey actually from the research period, the focus group in 2018 to, to write to sharing this report with you today. And I wanna pay tribute first of all to the participants of our research because all the ideas in this, in this work actually came from them. And to thank Simon and the Centre for Welfare Reform for helping to sustain um, this ongoing work. So the background to uh, this report was my previous research into the benefit system and policies around uh, disability employment. And from noticing that my own lived experience as a disabled person with chronic illness and my difficulties with work were missing from either disability assessments or policy solutions for work. And then I realized from my peer support networks online that it wasn't just my experience being overlooked or even that of other people with my condition, MECFS. It was lots of other people with a wide range of chronic illnesses that were being overlooked. And that was really the driver for our research. And what the Chronic Illness Inclusion Project has found overall is that while different diseases have their own unique clusters of symptoms that obviously impact differently on each person, the predominant and most restricting features of many chronic illnesses is fatigue or limited energy as well as pain. The term we use for all this is energy impairment. So energy impairment and energy limiting chronic illness, which I'm gonna to shorten to ELCI, are terms that have come out of our research and they're important to our advocacy work going forward as a disabled people's organization. And there's a reason that we call it energy impairment and not just fatigue. Because fatigue in both medical and general contexts is seen as a subjective sensation of tiredness that you can push through if you have the willpower. Medical science, unfortunately, lacks the tools to differentiate fatigue in healthy populations from say certain occupations, from fatigue found in chronic disease. But we know from lots of peer reviewed research that fatigue in chronic illness is both qualitatively and biologically different from a universal fatigue or tiredness. So this term energy impairment, we use it to convey this difference, to convey an objective loss of function and impairment and not a subjective state. So we use the label energy limiting chronic illness, ELCI, for conditions where energy impairment is a predominant feature. And this includes a range of neurological, musculoskeletal, autoimmune diseases, as well as obviously <coughs> ME and fibromyalgia. And now we can say that ELCI also includes, sadly, um, long COVID, people who are, are, are failing to properly recover from COVID-19. What can we say in demographic terms about ELCI? Well, the label is closely aligned to um, a category called impairment of stamina, breathing or fatigue, which is a category used by the Office for National Statistics um, and work on disability. An impairment of stamina, breathing or fatigue affects one in three disabled people of working age in the UK. And this comes from data held by the DWP um, in the Family Resources Survey. And yet this category, stamina, breathing fatigue, which we believe is close to energy impairment, is not used in any other government research into disability employment issues, disability employment rates. Um, it's not mentioned in the design of employment support and nor is it accounted for in the work capability assessment. So to tell you a little bit more about the experience of energy impairment, as I say, it's much more profound and it's also more multidimensional than fatigue. The key components of ELCI that we found affect, that affect work capability are the experience of payback, the presence of cognitive fatigue and dysfunction, and a fluctuating pattern, and in some cases also sensory sensitivity. Living with energy impairment means having a very limited reserve of energy that gets depleted by the slightest activity. Imagine a mobile phone that never charges more than say 20%. And this energy is reserved is drained by both mental and physical tasks. Living with ELCI means that we're constantly calculating the cost of every small aspect of daily living and rationing out our small supplies of energy to meet those needs. 
In relation to work, what this means is that for some people, the very act of getting dressed and feeding yourself might be as much or more than you can achieve in any one day with your energy reserve. So there's simply nothing left for traveling to work, let alone getting through a working day. If you have a less severe energy impairment, you may manage to hold down a job, but you can only do this at the expense of the social and leisure activities that, that everyone else does outside of work. What we're getting at here is that energy impairment describes a broad spectrum of capacity from people who are bedridden on the, on the one end and need support with self-care to people who may be able to function at work and appear non-disabled on the outside, but may be fighting a battle for recognition of their support needs and paying a high price for working in the rest of their lives. Payback is the idea that if you exceed the energy that's available to you, you pay a high price in terms of increased symptoms and increased impairment afterwards. For example, you may be bedridden for days. And this means that the issue of what we can and can't do as people with ELCI is really, really complex. And even ourselves, we struggle to say with certainty, with certainty what we can and can't do. Energy impairment causes cognitive difficulties as well as restricted mobility. The cognitive aspect of ELCI is every bit as restricting as the physical side and in many ways it's harder to adjust for or accommodate in the workplace and it's much less well understood. Cognitive fatigue possibly has the biggest impact on work capability and yet isn't factored into disability assessments. Fluctuation is a feature of ELCI but it's a lot more complex than the simple idea that we just have good days and bad days. With many systemic illnesses, symptoms do vary over months or weeks or even a single day, but our capacity also varies greatly according to how we've used our energy already within a given day and the payback that results from that. And this means that for us, disability is a dynamic experience and very different to stereotypical ideas of disability as a fixed state of being. Sensory sensitivity is important to mention in relation to work too, because with some chronic illnesses, anything from harsh lighting to background noise to everyday chemicals and cleaning products can exacerbate symptoms and create barriers to work. I'll just finish off by saying that there have been many reports into problems with the disability benefit system and many generations of programmes to get more disabled people into work. And what's new about our work is its focus on a large, a hidden cohort of disabled people who've previously been ignored in policy making. And this is because policy making has, has relied on these kind of more medicalized category of disease and disability, which only tell part of the story. And there's not been enough listening to the lived experience of disability and the realities of energy impairment. So we believe that change must begin with collecting the right data about disability employment to capture these realities the Labour Force Survey and the Annual Population Survey used by DWP to inform policy must include a category for energy impairment and ELCI. With over a million people now reporting symptoms of long COVID, this is more urgent than ever. Because unless you take account of the lived experience of disabled people, you can't begin to understand why they can or can't work, and you can't hope to design policies to improve our life chances. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, that was excellent. Um, so I'd now like to um, welcome our next speaker, who is Steph Benstead. Uh, Steph has a BA in Natural Sciences from the University of Cambridge, and she started her PhD there, but became ill due to what was later diagnosed as hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos and had to withdraw after a year. Uh, her illness led her into research in chronic illness, disability and social security. Uh, including the publication of um, a book on austerity and welfare reform for disabled people called Second Class Citizens, which I'll just give an extra plug for. Second Class Citizens is an absolutely excellent book. Um, and it's the most detailed analysis of what's gone on um, since 2010, including the background to those non-reforms of welfare uh, and a detailed analysis of how the current government and the previous governments have absolutely failed in their human rights obligations. So I'm looking forward to hearing what Steph has to say because it's always thoughtful and interesting. Steph. Oh thanks Simon. So I hope I live up to that. So I'm talking about how 
the energy limiting chronic illness relates to the benefit system. So to understand the issues that we have, we first need to understand how our benefits work. So we've got two modern disability benefits. We've got employment and support allowance, which is for people who are too sick or disabled to work. And we've got personal independence payment, which is the extra costs benefit for helping people with disability to pay for the things that they need because of their disability. And they're both designed based upon this idea that people with disability can't be trusted in their account of themselves and their abilities. This was argued for by Gordon Waddell and Mansell Aylward back in 2005. And in particular, they said that people who report having a chronic illness actually just have wrong attitudes and behaviours and beliefs. It's not that they're too ill to work, it's that they think they're too ill to work. And if you just told them that they can work, then they'd realise they could work and they'd magically get better and go out to work. So the, the benefit system has been designed to reduce the number of disabled people who get support because the people designing the benefits thought that a lot of people who were claiming support didn't actually need it, they just thought they needed it. And if only we told them they didn't need it, they'd realise they were okay. Now the two benefits, ESA and PIP, work in similar ways. They both ask about a person's ability to carry out a limited number of tasks. So for example, in ESA, it would ask whether you can stay to workstation for up to an hour, whether you're standing, sitting or moving between the two. Or for PIP, it would ask about whether you're able to get washed and dressed or do your own cooking. And you get points awarded based on whether you can do the activity without any problems, whether you need an aid, whether you need someone to help you or whether you can't do it at all. The difficulty for people with ELCI is that our ability to do an activity doesn't usually fall into this sort of hierarchy where the question is just how much help do we need? Because the real question isn't how do we do an activity, but how many activities we can do in a day. Now, previously under incapacity benefit, you could, it did actually capture at least some people with ELCI because it would give a low number of points for people who struggled with harder tasks like sitting comfortably for two hours, not just one, or walking 400 metres, or climbing a full flight of stairs without holding on. Whereas in ESA, they just look at, can you stay at a workstation for one hour? Can you walk 200 metres? Can you climb two steps? So people who struggled a little bit across a lot of different tasks could sometimes accumulate enough points across several different activities to get incapacity benefit. But unfortunately, because Waddle and Aylward and the ministers listening to them believed that a lot of people with chronic illness weren't actually disabled, they just thought they couldn't do stuff. They deliberately removed these low scoring options from ESA and there also aren't any such low scoring options in PIP. Now this makes sense if you think that most people are disabled because they have a severe issue in one or two activities such as they just can't walk at all or they're completely blind, they can't see at all. But unfortunately it writes chronic illness out of social security. So as an example, Someone with ELCI might report that on any given day they can do two activities out of cooking, washing or dressing. So this means that from the assessor's point of view, they can cook on two out of three days, wash on two out of three days and dress themselves on two out of three days, which is more than 50% of the time. And that's the threshold in the benefit system. If you can do something more than 50% of the time, you assess as having no problem with it at all. But actually, the person with ELCI always struggles to do the, 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 all three activities every day. Every day, they could only ever do two of them, which means they're always disabled. And they're just as disabled as someone who can never do one of those activities whilst always being able to do the other two. But the person with ELCI can't get support because their difficulty is spread across several activities rather than just being focused on one. This is made even worse when you think of the very many activities that someone with 
ELCI might also be unable to do, like doing their washing up, cleaning their house, going shopping, all of which reduce their capacity for the activities that are assessed, but this isn't taken into account either. And this failure extends to the issue of payback that Catherine mentioned. So when I've been assessed, I've been unable so far to convey to my assessors that the increased symptoms I experienced one or two days after an activity should count as part of the question of whether I can do something without severe symptoms. So both ESA and PIP will ask whether you can do something without severe discomfort, but the assessors assume that that severe discomfort has to happen in the moment. And if it happens a day or two later, then they disregard it. And they've tended to tell me that if my health deteriorates as a result of activity, then I should just reapply for benefits with my worsened symptoms. And what they don't get is that the increase in symptoms because of activity is part of my current level of health, and it's a major limiting factor in my illness. Payback also means I can't repeat an activity within a reasonable time frame, but again, I'm really struggling to get assessors and tribunal panels to understand how to apply the law in this area. And it's something that we see across everyone with chronic illness. We just haven't managed yet to get assessors and the tribunal panels to understand how ELCI works and what that means for how to interpret the points-based system that we do have. Now, as Catherine also said, there's often a lot of cognitive fatigue experienced by people with ELCI. And again, we run into a problem with the benefit system, this time because they deliberately separate out conditions deemed to be physical from those that they categorize as mental, behavioral or cognitive in origin. And if you have what's deemed to be a physical chronic illness, then none of your cognitive dysfunction will be assessed for ESA or PIP. Only your physical symptoms and any physical side effects of medicine is allowed to be considered. So neither the cognitive fatigue you experience as a direct result of LC, nor any cognitive fatigue you get as a result of side effects of medicine like painkillers will be taken into account. And obviously this is a major problem because the ability to think clearly is crucial to pretty much all forms of work. There aren't really any jobs where it's safe to make mistakes or where neither your quality nor your speed matters. But cognitive fatigue affects all of this, yet it isn't assessed by the benefit system. So the problem with benefit assessments for people with LC is firstly that assessors and tribunals don't seem to be applying the law properly because they don't understand the nature of ELCI and what it means for the ability to do something reliably, repeatedly, safely and in a timely manner, all of which is part of the regulations. But more importantly than that, it's because the assessments themselves are wholly unsuited for assessing ELCI. ELCI is about the amount of activity that can be carried out, not the type. And the assessments need to be designed to assess that. So this is going to require a complete revamp of the current assessment system, as the points-based activity-focused approach cannot be tweaked or reformed to assess people with ELCI. And I suspect that the findings here will also apply to people with a range of other conditions, such as mental health conditions, autism spectrum, and even traditional disabilities where there are elements of fatigue or the ability to cope up to but not beyond a somewhat variable and unpredictable point. So I think a lot of the findings that we've got, which is focused on the more physical chronic illness, does actually apply to a whole lot more of sick and disabled people, not just to ELCI. And this means that despite the relative recency of the creation of PIP, we can't use that as an excuse to leave it as it is and wait later before we replace it. We need to replace it now and we also need to replace ESA. And this needs to be done based on talking to people with ELCI and talking to people with the mental, behavioural or cognitive disabilities and talking to people with the more traditional disabilities and actually finding out what it means to have a particular condition and what that says about what you can do, what you struggle to do and what is the actual, the right questions to be asking. So that's, I suppose, a, a summary of most of what we talked about with the benefit system. There are 
a whole load of other well-known problems about assessors not believing people or making false inferences, some of which you can read in the report and also elsewhere. But I'm aware, time-wise, I'm going to draw it to an end now. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. And that was really useful and a really good... Um, a really good explanation of why it really does matter to understand the reality of experience and the dangers of policy making by people who are not listening to disabled people and not listening to the reality of things. So our next speaker is Dr. Joe Ingold, now at Deakins University um, in uh, Melbourne. Uh, Joe is Associate Professor of Human Resources Management uh, and she spent decades working in the areas of employability and skills services, uh, including in governments and the nonprofit sector. Joe's research interests are, are predominantly around employment services and employment enga employer engagement and the workplace inclusion of underserved labour market groups, including those with hidden disabilities. Joe has lived with experience of fibromyalgia and CFS and ME. And uh, Joe. It's great you can be here with us. Thank you, Simon, and greetings from Melbourne, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about ELCI and work and, um, and focusing on our findings and also our recommendations. So um, the key thing to point out is that a majority of our participants had a work experience um, and of a, in a variety of occupations and also at uh, quite high levels, you know, le levels of um, in, in professions. So I think this is really important to keep in mind and also uh, concurs with other studies of, of people with disability or disabled people. We use people with disability in Australia, but I know disabled people is the term used in the UK, so I try to use both. But it's important to note um, this because it's for me it's about uh, and for us it's about overturning this narrative that people don't want to work actually amongst our participants uh, the sense of purpose and meaning from life including through work was really strong and I'm going to focus here on two key sets of barriers the health related barriers to work and the structural barriers um, to work that our participants experienced which basically frustrated them in their attempts to engage in activities and Steph has already talked about the many issues with the benefit system which also pose barriers for people with ELCI engaging with other forms of activity that can help them to bring about a sense of purpose and meaning in their lives so again just to underscore uh, that we we really do want to challenge and we hope that our work does challenge what we feel is the prevailing narrative um, which has been perpetuated by um, some elements of, of politics and policy making and by the media that uh, that there are groups of people including those with the LCI who, who don't want to work but uh, so I'm going to focus firstly on the health related barriers um, and some of this really reflects what Catherine has already outlined in terms of how we are defining ELCI and also the elements that constitute this. So the key thing is, as Catherine's already mentioned, it's, it's really about being, it's be, about beyond fatigue. There's this uh, stigma that, uh, that these kinds of hidden conditions are just about fatigue, just about being tired. So the key thing that we would like to get across is, as, as most of the people here, everyone will know that it is about much more than that. And in terms of social security, as well, well as, as access to the workplace, it's Im important for policymakers and people delivering employment services to really have a, a feel for the fact that there are so many other elements to the, these conditions that include the amount of capacity for activity in total. We've got the battery metaphor that we're using in the report and another of, of, of other visual uh, metaphors as well. We've got the related to that, the pay 
playback so engaging in activity including just just getting ready to go to work the travel to work if if anything that that poses additional barriers to someone trying to get to work not having access to a disabled parking space for example in in the workplace or being able to get close you know an e easy commuting to and from work it's also about the fluctuation of uh, the condition and the symptoms that of course makes uh, it unpredictable um, it, uh, which means that planning for work activity uh, is really difficult there's a cognitive dysfunction um, and fatigue that, that Steph's already mentioned, which pose lots of problems. Brain fog was, of course, talked about as being a particular issue for people in their everyday lives and, and very frustrating. Um, also, the sensory um, sensitivity that Steph's also talked about. About as well, which can make it very difficult to be in particular workplaces where adjustments are not made. So there's all of that that, that we, we've already talked about quite a bit in relation to social security and actually defining, because we really think it's important to define what ELCI is, and this is what we've tried to do with this report. And then moving on secondly to the socially constructed barriers to work, we do work within the social model of disability rather than the medical model. So so our, our research really, really put into sharp relief the fact that there are significant socially constructed barriers to work. It's not just about um, people's psychological disposition towards work. It's about profound and rigid issues that exist in our workplaces across a, a multiplicity of sectors. So it's organizational patterns of work being rigid, um, job roles and the way that they're constructed being rigid, um, kind of a lack of imagination about how job roles are, um, are maintained and constructed, not taking into account flexibilities. Um, management culture, also a real, a really critical aspect here, particularly micromanagement culture. So this, this plays into as well a lack of autonomy that people ex people um, were experiencing, a lack of autonomy in their work and also heavy management. Um, and I know I experienced my, this myself working in public service service in Sheffield, actually, um, a kind of heavy micromanagement, which really failed to understand that you're a very capable person who actually, if some of these barriers were, were, were brought down for you, you could manage to engage in some form of activity. This relates as well critically to poor attitudes, which also reflects misunderstandings about the condition. Um, poor attitudes reflective of stigma as well um, and, and ignorance and a, a lack of willingness to engage, a lack of willingness to believe um, that, uh, that people have conditions as well. And, and so therefore not employers not willing to make adjustments. Importantly, what came out as well was a focus on time and attendance at work and this is certainly something I experienced in my own life rather than results and performance so that kind of presenteeism rather than um, than actually focusing on what someone could do and their outputs so this really leads to people feeling that they've either they've been pushed out of the workplace there were examples of that or feeling that they just couldn't do the job because so many obstacles were put in their way and then because we're also interested in how people connect with work when they've been out of the labour market for quite a number of years, and um, we're interested in, in what's happening around employment support and the restart contract um, has, has just been announced. Uh, the, the winners of those contracts, for example, have just been announced. So this is a very live issue. Um, what, we, what we identified from our research was a lack of targeted employment support and also provision for this group. Group, particularly in terms of recognizing the diversity um, of, um, of, of aspects in, and, and uh, symptoms that are part of this kind of mixed bag of these conditions. Um, also related, uh, just going back to the workplace, but also important in terms of that entry point into employment was the disclosure of disability of health conditions um, and when uh, 
the legalities around that, but also having um, an awareness of when it's it's okay, when it's beneficial to actually disclose about conditions, both to um, HR managers, um, to line managers, and also to co-workers, but being really scared that um, the attitudes of managers and co-workers in the past have been really hostile. There have been also denials of requests for reasonable adjustments. So all of that plays into uh, a really uh, a fear uh, of people with ELCI n not feeling comfortable disclosing about their illnesses because of having been badly treated in the past and, and maybe even um, pushed out of the workplace. So as Steph's already said, particularly thinking of the Waddle and Burton work, um, the idea that work is good for you in and of itself is clearly not correct. And our evidence, along with other evidence about these, these conditions, um, does bear this out. Um, but and, and what this really reflects is a lack of understanding of ELCI, um, which, uh, which plays into our recommendations as well. And importantly, I want us to know again that participants exhibited a desire to work and a desire to make a meaningful contribution to society and there was a real sense of frustration and obviously their interactions with the social security system and clinicians as well as employers uh, had really frustrated their attempts to be able to engage meaningfully in society. So Three, um, the, the, we've put forward some sets of adjustments and recommendations, so I'm just going to uh, briefly cover those. And we are also recommending a possible three categories of work capability of our own in the report. Um, so that's worth taking a look at. But I just want to turn to what we can do to counter some of these barriers that I've just identified from, we've identified from our research and I've just talked about. So a need for reduced hours, a desperate need for adjustments to job roles to how uh, to the the the, what's it what's included in job role descriptions thinking differently um, quite you know a, a real challenge for HR managers here for recruiting managers should we be thinking about job roles in the way that we've always thought about them or isn't it time we did something new and perhaps the post-COVID context um, can be an opportunity for that um, flexible working um, that means flexible working in the workplace but also working from home um, um, and um, an autonomy, bringing autonomy into those job roles in order to avoid basically um, those, the micromanagement that, that I've mentioned earlier. Importantly, awareness training for hiring managers for employers about ELCI conditions, because there's a real lack of awareness. And also, of course, we need the uh, ELCI to be defined specifically as a disability in and, in and of its own right. Job role redesign, I've already kind of mentioned, but that's uh, the term that I want to use, job role redesign, increased rights to flexible working, um, and, um, and also, um, finally, I want to talk about the, um, the support, the employability support. So what we've uh, had over successive employment service contracts is actually a reduction in the diversity of employment service support. So we need more diversity and specialism in order to, to service this group um, of, of individuals better in order to avoid missed opportunities and wasted talent that are so clear from our report. It's really wasted talent and it's an absolute disgrace that people are, are, are left you know, out of society, not socially included and also made to feel like they, um, they are not making an effort, you know, not, not engaging when actually there's a desperate need um, for, uh, for them uh, to, to engage, for us to engage, but to do it on our own terms and also uh, within a culture of understanding of ELCI. Um, and my final Final comment just to close this section is that people with ELCI may achieve social inclusion better through unpaid informal activities, better than through formal paid employment. And again, it's, it's important that those unpaid routes are supported through the social security system. But we hope and we believe that there is still plenty of scope uh, for people with ELCI to be able to participate in paid work if only workplaces and employers are willing to change. And it's past due time that they did. 
Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was great. And again, that's what it's. Uh, we're really lucky to have our our next speaker, Vicky Foxcroft, um, who is the Member of Parliament for Lewisham Deptford and who served as a local councillor in a constituency and worked for a trade union for over a decade. Um, Vicky is the Shadow Minister for Disabled People um, and she's fighting hard to ensure that disabled people's voices are being heard throughout the COVID-19 crisis. We've heard really from the previous speakers how the this injustice, this growing injustice facing people with energy limiting chronic illness has in many regards been driven by both kind of ideology and ignorance in a kind of toxic cocktail. So it would be great to hear from Vicky about what we can do to reverse this. Thank you, Vicky. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Simon. And, and thank you for inviting us. I mean, this work is so um, important. Um, and I just um, want to just mention um, Catherine Hale, who um, lives in my constituency um, and has really, um, you know, gone to, you know, inform me better and make sure that the, the issue of um, energy limiting chronic illness is, is far higher up um, the political and the um, public's agenda. Um, I think, uh, you know, the testimony you've heard from all of the speakers, um, you know, it's incredibly hard to um, follow that as a politician. Um, but I'm just going to go and um, share one thing with you. Um, and um, as Simon just said, you know, I was a trade union official um, before I was an MP. And I rem remember representing somebody um, with ME and the challenges that were faced. And I saw in the comment that somebody said that their employer said, you're good when you're here. Um, and that's what she was always told. You're good when you're here. Um, and she had to work with um, banknotes that had chemicals on it. And she'd say, do you know, when, I, when I'm with the chemicals, it, it really um, triggers me and you know stops me being able to come back to work. And they said, well, if you improve your attendance working with those banknotes with the chemicals, um, then we can look in terms of moving you elsewhere. But it was triggering her and, and making her not be able to improve the attendance. So, you know, the kind of comments that I've seen that people has, have raised are ex exactly kind of the first time um, when I was representing a young woman um, with an ME trying to get the employer um, to be reasonable. Um, and we talk about reasonable adjustments, you know, it is about being reasonable um, at times. Um, I think one of the lines that I read in the report that really um, hit home to me um, was misunderstood, discredited, denied or disbelieved. Um, and I think that very much is, is the case when people are talking about energy limiting chronic illness. And I think it's really important um, that you highlight the need for the new terminology. So moving away from saying phrases such as fatigue, because that just sounds like somebody's tired and needs a good night's sleep and, and really doesn't understand the complexities um, around MHG limiting chronic illness. The one thing that I want to say um, in terms of me and the Labour Party and something that everybody's gone and requested so far and I've seen in the in the chat is we are listening we are listening and we are learning and we absolutely want to get things right in the labor party and i um read through the recommendations around employment um you know making sure we don't lose that wasted talent um but being more flexible so flexible in terms of options for working from home reduce our hours um, looking in terms of technology and, you know, during the COVID crisis, we've seen um, the movement to be able to do stuff online that wasn't claimed could happen before. You know, the movement to be able to work from home when people were deemed as not trusted from working from home to now, um, you know, it, it being standard for most people and also the stuff around um, improving access to work. When people can gain access to work, it's absolutely um, fantastic. But there's too many problems with the 
um, system, and we know that that needs to be um, reformed. Um, I do think um, the, the the timeliness of your report and the need to make sure that people understand um, long COVID, um, that we stand up for them, that they will learn um, a lot from your um, research um, and making sure that we do have a better, more inclusive society for everyone. Um, I also recognise the um, areas of the report touching on social care reform for it to need to be um, more under uh, understanding of different people's conditions and then on work capability assessments. You know, any MP that you would speak to who deals with people who go through the PIP assessment would say for, for everyone that's having to go through it, it is a a uh, terrible system that is degrading um, and that so often doesn't understand different people's circumstances and even more so for those with energy limiting chronic illness as many of the speakers have outlined and I've seen um, lots of comments um, in the chat box. Um, so um, kind of in finishing, you know, I will make sure that I use the right terminology in terms of energy limiting chronic illness, ELCI, that we need to make sure that we really promote that and that everybody does. Um, I will do my bit in terms of making people more um, aware, particularly around um, this research, which is not only timely, um, is not only extremely powerful from the testimony um, within it, but is extremely important. And that as we um, look to develop um, any new um, reforms of the benefit system, we know that the work capability assessments are not working, that we'll do it together um, because you have the lived experience, you are the experts by experience, and we will only do these things better, more inclusive, um, for everyone um, by doing it together. So thank you very much for having us along today. That was brilliant, Vicky, and I'm sure that was the message people really hope to hear from you and uh, we'll look forward to working with you in, in the years going forward. Thank you. Um, we were going to have Victoria Clutton speak, who's one of the research participants and somebody who's with real lived experience of ME, but again, just to underline the reality of of chronic illness. Um, Victoria was just too poorly to join us today. So um, our next speaker is um, Pippa Stacey, who is a writer and blogger with ME and chronic fatigue syndrome with a particular interest in inclusive education and employment. And she works as a communications consultant for Astrid. Um, she's gonna play as a little film as well. And I'll let her introduce Astrid to you. Take it away. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. As you heard there, my name is Pippa. Um, I'm a writer and a communications consultant and I'm here on behalf of Astrid today. Uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to say congratulations again on the launch of this report and thank you so much for having us here today. Even just listening to the speakers so far has just been amazing and I think it represents a real move forward for all of us. It was actually my own experiences of energy limiting chronic illness that led me to where I am right now. I have ME, I really struggled my way through university, made it to graduation, and I was immediately confronted by the lack of opportunities for people like me. I, would, um, I did look into support services designed for disabled people, but I found that I was still falling through the gaps. And there was even one well-known scheme designed specifically for disabled graduates who wouldn't even allow me to continue my application because I disclosed that I wasn't well enough to work full time. And as we all know, um, I'm far from alone in these experiences. And we know there are thousands of chronically ill people in the UK alone who have all of these skills and all of this experience who are routinely being excluded from the world of work. It was my own experiences that led me to Astrid, first as a candidate and now as one of the team. So as you can imagine, I'm quite the fan of what we do. And what I'd like to do now is show you just a short video from our CEO, Steve Schutz, who can tell you a bit more about the charity and how it all works. So roll video now, please, Joe, if that's okay. 
So the best way to explain Astrid is to put yourself in the shoes of our candidates. Just imagine that you have been diagnosed with a chronic health condition. You find that going to work is made difficult, much more difficult, probably even impossible, but you still have all the skills and talent to offer. Uh, my brother David was diagnosed with cancer days after his 50th birthday. He'd had a glittering career in the Royal Navy where he'd been a commander and made an OBE and in business where he'd been a director of the CBI. But then suddenly everything stopped. His diagnosis made him feel as if he was a person without value. In the UK, we believe that well over 10 million people of working age have a chronic illness or a disability and we call that community the invisible talent pool. And so our charity called Astrid is about connecting that community of people in the invisible talent pool with companies who are looking for talent and expertise. Businesses can help us in one of three ways. First of all, they can post a job um, and we will fill that job. They're looking for part-time or flexible resource. We will find somebody to, to, be, to, to fill that job. Secondly, we look for companies that have got volunteer programs. If they've got a volunteer program, we are always in need of professional help and we'd love to get those volunteers to help our charity to grow and to amplify its message. And the third thing is we always need funds. Um, as an organization that is entirely self-funded, we talk to businesses and say, how can we be part of your charitable story? Can we be beneficiaries of your charitable donation? Work restores mental well-being and a sense of normality, as you know, Pippa. Um, and so we're looking for help from businesses to help us to support the invisible talent pool. So how does it work on a day to day basis? And with the charity being free at the point of use for the individuals, how is it all funded? Yeah, so on a day to day basis, we're all about telling our story. We tell our stories to candidates. Uh, we're always looking to recruit more candidates from communities of, uh, of disabled uh, charities, of people with chronic illness, um, to uh, expand our reach into those communities as well as the communities of carers as well. We've got over 1,100 candidates on our database. We're also looking to tell the stories to companies. Companies are encouraged to sign up and to then place opportunities with us. Now, those opportunities are very broad. They might be paid, they could be voluntary. They could be assignments, they could be projects. They're probably part-time and they're probably remote and flexible working, but any type of role at all that will give somebody meaningful work is welcome to be entered onto the platform. Then the third thing we do really is just run a small charity. So we have a number of volunteers, a large number of volunteers. We have to recruit those, brief those, and get them to work to make them feel as if they're delivering something meaningful. Uh, we have a lot of fundraising activity and we spend a lot of our time on fundraising events to make sure that we can keep the charity going. And we're always looking to improve our technology as well and speed up the connections that we make. Brilliant, thank you very much. So as you heard Steve say there, we're doing all kinds of things at the minute. We connect individuals with jobs, but we also support people who are at various different stages of what we call their work ready journey. And we pride ourselves on doing that in a way that suits their individual needs. So to name just a few of these things, we offer bespoke training courses, CV and LinkedIn support, flexible work experience opportunities, mentoring from industry professionals, and there are absolutely loads of other initiatives we're hoping to develop in the future as well. So what we have at the moment at Astrid is this team full of people full of subject expertise and insight and over a thousand candidates signed up to the platform who are full of skills and potential and seeking flexible work. We know that we're equipped to support employers with job carving and to connect individuals and businesses, but despite this, the charity is still entirely self-funded. Now, we don't mind fundraising and goodness knows we have our fun with it, but the more of our time and energy we have to put into this side of things, the less we can give to what we set out to do, connecting individuals with long-term illnesses with meaningful work. We do innovate and we stretch our services as far as we can, but the fact of the matter is that we don't yet have the high profile collaboration that would make our services routinely available across the country. I hope you'll forgive me for glancing down at my notes. The um, cognitive impairment has come out to play today. So why is this collaboration so important and why does it need to happen now? I think that between the organisations here today, we're beginning to paint this really clear picture of how people with the LCI are consistently being let down by employment policy and social security. And what we found is that so many of the points raised in this report 
perfectly reflect what we've been seeing in our candidates' real and lived experiences. We have this severe lack of inclusive roles. We know that the welfare system is full of inconsistencies that prevent people accessing support. And we know that those who do manage to find work are then facing multiple additional barriers in the workplace too. And we actually have our own research findings on that last point coming out in the near future. So do keep an eye out from those. So to give you an example of how this particular report translates into the work we're doing, something we've been exploring at the moment as a charity is this binary of whether someone can or can't work over 16 hours per week and the impact this has on their social security. Again, we found that the inconsistencies and rigidity within the disability benefit system means many people with chronic illnesses are being forced to make an impossible decision. They could either forfeit the chance to work at all, to even have a chance at accessing support from the state, or they could choose to pursue part-time work, but in doing so, risk losing the social security that makes up for the gap in their wages from working part-time. So as you can imagine, when you're in that situation, you just can't win. And to then take that one step further, as a charity, we've also been discussing just how effective this hours-based model of employment is to start with. We actually have reason to believe that task-based employment, as opposed to hours-based employment, could in fact be more accessible for some people with the LCI. And again, it's very, very early days with that one, so you're going to have to keep an eye on the charity. But I think this is just one example of how our subject expertise here at Astrid is helping to adapt traditional models of thinking to better suit the needs of people with ELCI. Again, it's just a case of needing funding, profile and collaboration to enable this development to continue. So that's a very brief insight into the issue, but what action would we like to see? First and foremost, we are wholeheartedly supporting this report's calls to action. In particular, the income security for people who are working part-time, a more targeted approach to employment policy and increased awareness of ELCI as a discrete impairment group. Now, as a charity, Astrid is ideally placed to tackle these issues, but to make that happen, we also have three calls to action of our own. First of all, we need funds, and that's so we can keep our services free at the point of use for individuals with chronic illnesses. Secondly, we're always in need of volunteers and industry experts who can mentor our talented candidates. And finally, we just really need to find ways of showing employers that right now is the time to be exploring inclusive roles and recruiting chronically ill talent. And again, it's been touched on a bit already here, but I think a post-COVID world is one that really needs to embrace inclusivity and flexibility. And it's just absolutely essential that people with long-term health conditions are a part of that conversation. So to sum up, we are doing what we can here at Astrid, but we urgently need support on a wider scale to take our work to the next level and also ensure that we can support the organisations here today as best as we can. We're all here and we're all ready to talk. We're a friendly bunch. So I urge you to get in touch with the charity if you or anybody you know might be in a position to discuss any of these issues further. You can find out more about us by visiting our website, astrid.org. That's Astrid with two eyes. And you can reach our CEO, Steve, by emailing steve.schutz at astrid.org. So I think that's it from me for now. Just thank you very much for listening. And of course, congratulations again on the launch of this report. It's truly groundbreaking work. It means a lot to me on a personal level as well as a professional level. So thank you once again. And I'm very excited to see how we can move things forward together. Thank you. Thank you, Pippa. That was really clear and uh, very encouraging to hear about such creative thinking and practical support for folk um, and and also very tight and very sharp to sharply to time we're currently running at um, we've got 25 minutes left and we will finish at 12 30 some people are just wanting to check the finish time um, I'm really pleased that for really our last speaker now we will have probably a little bit of time for questions i imagine i don't imagine carol will talk for 25 minutes so I'll, but our last speaker is carol monaghan who is the uh snp uh mp for glasgow northwest i'm very excited about this carol i used set up an organization called inclusion glasgow and used to get people out of uh, lennox castle hospital so i used to drive through where you're mp from um and um I'm going to also just note at this point that some of the points that Pippa and Steph were making 
um, can be used, it's not been mentioned in this discussion, but as a strong argument for basic income, which is, of course, a policy position supported by the SNP and uh, sometimes by the Labour Party, but we're still working on the Labour Party. Um, so, um, Carol, it's great that you're joining us. Carol is uh, chair of the APPG on ME and has been um, led the campaign in the UK Parliament to change attitudes towards ME, uh, has led a number of landmark debates on ME research and the controversial PACE trials, which the Centre for Welfare Reform has also covered, which are a kind of outrageous uh, misuse of public policy research. So thank you for all of that work, Carol, and um, please talk to us about your perspective on this and the and the research that's been launched today. Thanks. Thanks very much, Simon. And it's a, a real pleasure to be able to speak to you today. So thanks for the invite to um, for me to make some comments. I mean, it's, it's quite interesting. The timing of this is quite interesting because, of course, with long COVID, um, many of the issues that we are discussing have been brought sharply into the public eye and people have far greater awareness than perhaps they would have done even a year ago. So I think it's it's right that we kind of strike where the iron's hot, as it were. So um, I'd like to just congratulate the authors of the report and I very much welcome the recommendations of this. It's interesting because over the last year, and I'll say just, just a wee bit about the PPG, it's interesting because one of the, the great positive aspects of COVID is that the APPG for ME has been able to um, really listen to the lived experience of those with ME in a way we wouldn't have been able to do had we been having physical meetings in Parliament. So Zoom meetings have actually allowed us to um, reach out to far more people, which is important. And over the, the last year, we've been carrying out a number of evidence sessions really looking at different aspects of life with people for people, specifically with ME, but many of um, many of the, the issues for people with ME could equally be applied to people with other ELCIs. And we've looked at things like education. And I just first of all, I'd like to say congratulations for Pip, to Pippa for managing to um, navigate herself through the education process for many people. Um, living with ME and other conditions like this, um, they're actually not, they really struggle to access education. And that was one of the things we heard about. But one of the sessions we had was about employability and access to welfare benefits for those with ME. And it's interesting reading through um, the report um, on ELCIs, many of the recommendations that have been made in this report are similar to a report that we are drafting as an APPG on ME. And for those that don't know, an APPG is an all-party parliamentary group, so it really does, it's cross-party and includes members from, from right across the House and in, in, indeed some members of the House of Lords as well. So it's really working to try and push for change it was clear from the evidence that we got that um, for too many people with ME and other ELCIs, um, employment support allowance, personal independence payments are just totally, are, are, they're cut off from being able to access these despite their entitlement to these benefits. And I think Steph set out many of the, the issues in that. What we've heard is that people can appeal and often do appeal and there are people welfare rights advisors that can help them to do this and they'll go on and win their cases which indicates that there's something wrong uh, with the initial system that is failing but we have to recognize also that many people do not have the energy to bring their case to appeal because it really the effort required to do so can greatly exacerbate their symptoms and that's that's important so we need to be looking at how we support those that are falling through the gaps and are living with the support, without the support, sorry, that they actually need. And if I can maybe just uh, possibly reiterate some things that have been said, but um, things we found out about the 
uh, these medical assessments, DWP medical assessments, we found that they were not fit for purpose, particularly in relation to fluctuating medical conditions, because people can have good days and bad days, and this is not recognised by these assessments. They also, they also don't look at how long a person can carry out a task for, or whether they can repeat a task. Um, and we know from our experience that often if they're asked, can you walk 50 yards or 100 yards, they can say yes. But the, the next question that's missing is, how does that make you feel for the rest of the day or for subsequent days? And it's not right to say that somebody that can carry out a task is then fit to be working full time in a busy environment. Um, so we, we need to look at that. Um, but the other problem is that for these assessments, you, you need to go with supportive medical evidence. And when some healthcare professionals are looking on conditions like ME um, as um, psychosomatic or um, not having physical manifestations, it's very difficult to engage with a healthcare professional and get the evidence that you need about your real lived experience. So some things we would be looking for, I mean, the, the DWP must review the way assessments are undertaken, particularly with, for people with fluctuating medical conditions. Um, Individuals should only be classified as being able to carry out a task if they don't experience adverse after effects. Any healthcare professional carrying out a medical effect, a DWP medical effect assessment should have to complete training on fluctuating conditions and um, ELCIs uh, so that they understand the way in which these conditions manifest themselves for the person living with them. They shouldn't be a points-based scoring system that, that marks someone as being able to, is getting points for being able to do a task if they can't repeat them. Um, for many people with these conditions, the failure of healthcare professionals to recognise and appreciate the reality means that sometimes they go to private healthcare providers to get a second opinion or to go to someone that actually has specific expertise in these areas. And often the assessments will disregard this because it isn't their own GP that has provided that. So there has to be flexibility in how this sort of evidence is dealt with. Another thing we, um, we discovered was that people that had, for example, private healthcare insurance um, were been asked to go through very similar uh, assessments as the DWP would do in order to assess whether these individuals actually were entitled to their insurance payments. Um, so we've also, as an EPPG, we've written to a uh, insurance providers about this, and they've given us some assurances on this, but really we need to hear more from those that have had personal experience of this and whether that is, um, whether what the insurance companies are telling us is matching what the lived experience is. Other things we've been doing in terms of the APPG in, in 2019, two years ago now, it seems, seems like just yesterday, we met with the Disabilities Minister and um, DWP assessors specifically to discuss the issue of medical assessments for those with invisible disabilities or hidden disabilities. Too often we were hearing from people, assessors saying things like, well, you look fine. Now, um, as people have told us, if they're going out to, to attend an assessment, they do try and put on, dress smartly, put on their makeup, sort their hair, whatever else. They don't want to appear. Um, they're embarrassed about how they appear usually, so they do want to try and put their best foot forward. And this then is, is <laughs> unfairly impacting them whenever their um, assessment is carried out. 
So we had a meeting, and again, we the assessors gave us some uh, commitments on this. And again, we need to hear more. We need to hear, has there been any change over the last year or so in the way these assessments are being carried out? I understand, obviously, with COVID, uh, things have been quite difficult over the last year, but we do want to hear from people. What we do hear from those that are struggling to access benefits is assessments for PIP generally are done in a more sympathetic manner than assessments for ESA. And so we, we need to change that and we need to make sure that both these benefits are given equal priority. But there's a few things, um, sorry, before I move on, um, the, the, few things uh, we need to look at in terms of those who want to and have a desire and an ability to carry out some sort of work. Uh, employers must have awareness of how the condition fluctuates, how the condition manifests itself and how it limits the type of tasks that are able to be carried out. And Vicky's example of um, the chemicals and banknotes is, is, is pretty clear that employers like that are not listening to those um, to their employees on this. So it's about employer awareness, it's about ad adaptations, but it's also about agreed responsibilities and hours of work. Now, it's sometimes it's not enough to say, I'm a full-time worker or I'm a part-time worker. We might need more flexibility that within from week to week, there's going to be variability in the hours at work that are worked. And employers that are able to adapt and take that on are going to obviously be able to get the most out of their employees who are who have this desire and an ability to do a certain amount of work. But one thing I would encourage people to do is to write to your elected representatives. You have two of us on the call today, but there are many more who will have an interest in this and detail what their issues, your issues are and detail what you want us to do as a result. And it's it's often the, the situation for us, us is people tell us all sorts of problems. And unless we have specific experience in that area, we don't necessarily understand what's, what the next steps are. So be quite clear if you want your elected representative to write to a minister, ask them to do that. If you want them to speak to their employer, ask them to do that, but be clear about what your asks are so that you can get the best out of any meetings with elected representatives. And I know we want to leave time for questions, so I will, I will just finish up by thanking, um, thanking you once again for inviting me to speak today, congratulating the authors. I think this is a really important and timely report, and I look forward to hearing more about it and seeing some, some of these changes that are called on actually being implemented. Thank you so much, Carol, and thank you for the invitation to stay connected. Um, so, we, well, we've done quite well at keeping to time, it slips a wee bit, but you always do, and we have about 10 minutes left. So there's the Q&A questions, there are loads of really good questions, and there's been loads of comments and questions and queries as we've been going through um, and I think it'll be hard to do justice to those in 10 minutes however what I suggest we should do is I'm going to ask um, some of the speakers to just have a, a minute or so to maybe see what they've picked up maybe what their comment is and maybe what their sense of the way forward is so really just a very short response Perhaps if they've noticed a question that they feel like that really does deserve an urgent response or a point of clarification that they want to make, or just their own reflection on uh, the whole process and the prospects going forward at a time when um, there are many reasons to be hopeful, despite the weird and broken nature of modern politics in the United Kingdom. Um, there are many good people around doing good things. So. Um, I'm going to ask maybe uh, Catherine to start us off and go in the order that we've been through uh, just for a very quick response. So Catherine, would you just give your kind of thoughts briefly? Hi. Um, yeah, I've just really, really enjoyed um, hearing everybody else speaking. 
um, and thank you all so much for attending. Uh, I have to confess that the cognitive fatigue has really set in for me now, so I'm, I might not make very much sense. Um, and, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to, I think the questions in the Q&A are really interesting and I can't respond to them properly now, but, but please could you um, email me for the more detailed kind of substantive questions, because I really would like to make a proper reply. Um, I'm just going to pick up quickly on a, a question that I came across very early on, um, which was asking, talking about overlapping and multiple conditions and asking whether uh, a mental health condition like depression could be counted as an ELCI, because I think they're really interesting questions. And, um, and just start to say that, that, yes, what we were astonished by in our sort of large survey, a different piece of work, over 2,000 people responded to it with chronic illness, was that actually um, on average people responded oh people reported over three different health conditions it was very rare that people only mentioned one condition so like this is called multimorbidity and, and multimorbidity is is absolutely a, a kind of key a key um component of, of elci and why it's important to move away from just talking about diagnosis to talking about an impairment experience and that's that's really what we're trying to do so to answer the other question, is depression an energy limiting chronic illness? If it causes energy impairment for you, then yes, that is your impairment experience. And, and we know that 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 many um, well, we know that for a, for a start also that um, that about two out of five participants in our survey resp um, reported a comorbid mental health condition. So depression, anxiety, extremely common among people with ELCI. So we don't necessarily know which came first kind of thing, or, you know, which is the predominant condition. It's a, that's um, mental health comorbidity is, is a, a key feature of, of energy limiting chronic illness. And that we need to get away from this um, medical model of, of categorizing disabled people by a diagnosis and to, to sort of think about instead different impairment experiences. And we think that absolutely energy impairment can be a feature of a mental health condition, can, can apply to people with autism. And I've heard people with um, conditions like cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy um, say that they that, that concept of energy impairment resonates with them. So absolutely, it's not an exclusive term. It's, you know, if it resonates with you, then, then that's a great thing. So I hope that's, that's answered um, the question. That's really helpful, Catherine. Thank you. Steph, would you like to uh, endeavour as a try? It's a, it's a huge task, this, isn't it? But have you got a little thought that you'd like to just share on reflecting on the, the event and the whole process? Um, yeah, I noticed in the comments we have some occupational therapists who've been watching and commenting. And I, I think that's a really interesting profession with a lot of relevance to what we need to do next because having described what ELCI is and what the issues are we obviously do then need to be able to take that forward into the social security system and be able to start saying to the DWP and to political parties look maybe these are the questions you should be asking maybe these are how you should be doing the assessments and, and employers as well will want to know what are the adaptations they need to make and I I'm hoping, because I'm not, not being an occupational therapist, that occupational therapy is a profession that could have a lot of insight on that. If it's, as I believe, uh, based on assessing, you know, what are the things that people can do and what can't they do and what support do they need and how do they manage their health and their abilities so I think it would be really interesting to be able to talk to some occupational therapists and maybe do some research in the future that includes occupational therapy to try and get some idea of what should be the questions we ask in our benefit assessments and how should we assess people. Um, so if you're an occupational therapist and you're interested in this, then yeah, do get in contact with, with Catherine or any of us. Um, it would be really great to hear from you and to hear your thoughts on this as well. Thanks, Steph. And I think there are quite a few comments that people have made, which again, we'll keep a record of all of this about other groups, trade unions, citizen advice, and uh, where we should perhaps be creating kind of strategic connections. So I think these are all really welcome thoughts. Joe, would you like to give your thoughts? 
in this final Thanks, stage. Simon. Yeah, I just just briefly, I wanted to pick up on the points that the fantastic um, stuff in the chat, but particularly the point about trade unions um, and um, and also the disability passports. So uh, I I think we'd be really interested to think more about that. Um, and also there was a question about training and whether any organisations are providing training on ELCI. I don't think we identified any. Um, so if anyone knows of anyone doing great work out there, um, it's important to say that for the next stage of our work, because this isn't the end, there's obviously so much more to do. Um, so we're looking um, for, uh, for potential partners and, and obviously to work with organisations that want to make and individuals that want to make changes um, about ELCI and in particular about work. I know the Business Disability Forum does some great work um, in terms of producing briefings for its members and has quite a well-developed understanding um, of, of ELCI. Um, yeah, relatively. And I'm also noticing just in my short time in Australia, some interesting differences here. So, um, so I think there's a lot more work to be done. So please do reach out to us and we will take the time to look um, through the chat. But I finally just wanted to make a brief comment on long COVID. Um, and also uh, something that we've been reflecting on recently is that it's just so heartening to see how well this seems to have been received in terms of this more sort of sociological piece of work because a number of us when we were working on this years ago uh, felt that it was quite quite a sort of quite difficult to get some traction in this area so I'm really uh, glad to see this and also with with the long COVID uh, debates um, that are in the public domain and obviously the similarities between um, the conditions under our umbrella term of ELCI I hope that we can work with the long COVID community and we already are um, doing some work there in, um, in order to sort of provide um, a more yeah coherent uh, information and kind of lobbying force uh, to decision makers. Thank you, Joe. Okay, I, uh, I, Pippa, would you like to say anything in, just in terms of overall? You've talked about Astrid, but maybe just also with your lived experience, have you got a little? comment or thought or anything you've seen you'd like to respond to from the questions mm, more so less so my lived experience more so Astrid more generally it's just been really encouraging to see the positive response to the concept of task-based employment and that is something that we're going to explore in more depth um, but it's really encouraging to see that that's something that people would be interested in exploring and then I think the thing I wanted to emphasize more than anything is that we've talked a lot about how people are being failed at the moment um, but we do know that there are employers who are out there who want to do better and they want to be allies so if you are one of those employers or you know one of those employers who want to do better but they don't quite know how to get started where to go um, I'd urge you to send them in Astrid's direction as well as the candidates because we have ways of supporting them and ensuring that it's a mutually beneficial process for both employers and candidates um, I'm conscious of time, so I will leave it there. But yeah, thank you very much for the kind words and keep an eye on it. We're working on it. Thank you, Pippa. Uh, Joe, could you put up the final slide then? I think we'll come to the end of the session now, but I just want to just say something in, in, uh, in about next steps. Um, the, the report uh, is published by the Centre for Welfare Reform, but it's really the product of work by... Um, Chronic Illness Inclusion, uh, which was Chronic Illness Inclusion Project, but has, has now given itself, has taken away the word project. And that symbolizes really that the this community of um, disabled people, people with lived experience of energy limiting chronic illness have formed themselves into this um, new organization. Um, so we're very happy to have helped make that happen. But there's a, a new website for the organization um, where you can also download the report. There's a Twitter account, uh, Catherine, Steph, um, many, many, many other folk will be working onwards on this project. Um, there's a way of signing up, although I noticed in the in the chat that some folk were having trouble accessing the um, 
website. I don't know why that is because it seemed to work for me okay, but sometimes these things uh, you just try again later. So I think that those, those last messages really about reaching out to other groups, joining in, joining into uh, this community, building bridges are really important. One last call for me, maybe on behalf of Catherine and Steph and everybody, is all of this work has been done either for, almost all of it's been done for love, for no money, and um, a little bit of it has been done for a very, very, very small amount of money. Um, there's been no real fa sub financial support other than through the drill program of, of the National Lottery. Um, so uh, if you're a funder or if you know any funders or if you're an employer or anybody else who wants to support the inclusion of hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of people who experience energy limiting chronic illness, then why not back the folk who are doing this cutting edge work? Um, that's, so that's my last message. Please get behind this movement, get involved, uh, stay connected. And hopefully if we all work together, we can bring about some of the changes that are really needed. Thank you all very, very much. The recording will be up on both the Centre for Welfare Reforms uh, YouTube account, and it will be on the uh, Chronic Illness Inclusion YouTube account, and probably linked on both websites, as is the report itself. I suspect I've forgotten some key other thing I was meant to say, but it feels like we've done, covered an awful lot of ground and, and there'll be an answer out there somewhere. So thank you all very, very much for coming today. It was great to have so many participants, so many great questions and the support of all our sponsors and the speakers. Thank you all and bye for now.